Thank you, Ivan. Um, Ivan and I got to know each other as members of the planning committee, and I could tell that I wanted to meet him, and I'm so glad to have done so, and thank you for that, that framing. Uh, I do have one question, but I'll leave that for the, for the discussion period. Um, I want to thank uh, the Institute of Medicine, and particularly um, the Forum on Public-Private Partnerships, and in particular for the two people across the way, Clarence, uh, Clarion and uh, Kimberly for steering the planning committee and this event. And I was intrigued, in fact, I hadn't quite understood that this was the inaugural workshop of this particular forum. And I think it's really a delight, an honor, a pleasure, because for somebody like myself who's worked on the informal economy for quite a few years, um, to have this as the heart of the discussion in the um, inaugural session is, is really important um, to me and to, I'm not just from Harvard University, I'm really here because I coordinate a global action research network on the informal economy called WeGo. Um, all right, I'm going to try. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> uh, my remarks will be in four parts. I'll do a little introducing of uh, the definitions and concepts of informal employment, and um, also share some recent data. The data are improving, folks. We do have more data. We have data now. The ILO and WeGo have a database with data from 50 countries uh, capturing those categories that were in the diagram that Bob um, shared with us before. So we are getting better on the data. Um, and then I'll talk about um, the risks of exposure and the barriers to access that are faced by uh, informal workers. Um, and this would be based on some research that was done. I'm bringing in the research work, Roger, um, by um, the WeGo work Network and our partners in 10 cities around the world. So it's on the urban informal workforce, which is the topic here. Um, and then I'll illustrate the findings with three particular cases of urban informal workers, home-based workers, street vendors, and waste pickers. And over the break, uh, Mirai and I were talking. Um, if you think of the female workforce in India, also in neighboring Pakistan, in modern India, modern Pakistan, 30% of the female workforce is home-based. Uh, so it's a very significant sector, but not only for women. There are also a lot of men who do repair and other kinds of work from the homes. Um, and then I'll, I'll end with some thoughts about the way forward and some of the key issues and the different models and, that we need to think about over these two um, days. Um, but first, I just wanted to say one thing about the WeGo Network, because our commitment is to increasing three Vs for the informal workforce. The first is uh, voice, and we do that by supporting and helping to strengthen and build organizations of informal workers and networks of those organizations by sector. So national, regional, and international networks of four groups of informal workers in particular we have worked with, domestic workers, and the three groups that I'll feature in the presentation today. The second V is visibility. So we have a program on statistics, and it's headed by somebody who worked in UN statistics for all of her career until she joined WeGo. And we collaborate with the ILO and the International Conference of Labor Statisticians and the UN Statistical Division to improve official data. So we're very seriously committed to uh, increasing visibility in official statistics, but also, of course, through research. And then for the sake of a third V, we call it um, validity, which is that the informal workers are not the problem. Like you said, the informal workers are mostly working poor, trying to earn an honest living, but the policy and regulatory environment make it extremely difficult. For them. So the problem really lies with the policy regulatory environment, not with the majority. There's a small wedge of the informal economy that's criminal, illegal, underground, gray, black, whatever term is being used, but the vast majority are, are working poor. Um, and um, 
One of the functions of the WeGo network is bridging the micro and the macro, the grassroots and the mainstream. And so it's a great honor that we're here today with you and that we have several speakers from the WeGo network, and including most notably Mirai Chatterjee who, from SEWA, which is a founding uh, member of WeGo. So concepts and terms and definitions. These were used in the agenda. Uh, they're there in paper, but I just wanted to go over them again. And I was very glad for Bob to use that diagram. And I looked at it carefully. And it does capture correctly these, um, these interrelated uh, concepts. Um, initially, um, the informal sector was thought about in terms of enterprises. There was an enterprise-based definition. And this was adopted by the uh, International Conference of Labor Statisticians in 1993. Um, and it refers to the production and employment that takes place in, and this is the definition, unincorporated enterprises, enterprises that are not a legal entity and don't report their accounts. Um, some countries also use, they're not registered with a local authority or, or they're small. So these universal definitions, there's always a little flexibility around the edges for different countries to use. But at the core, they're not legal entities. Um, informal employment is a broader concept with its own definition that Frankly, the WeGo network fought for long and hard because we knew that a lot of the members of SEWA, for instance, were not just working in informal enterprises, right? Some of them were working for formal enterprises. Some of them were working for households. Some were casual day laborers that had six different employers. So we had to capture something broader. And so this um, broader concept was developed with the ILO and was adopted by the International Conference of labor statisticians in 2003. So it refers to, it's an employment-based definition, and it refers to employment without social protection through work, i.e. without an employer contribution, both inside and outside the informal sector, which is part of the concept, but it's the narrower part. And so this could be for informal enterprises, for formal enterprises, or for households. Not all domestic workers uh, are without social protection contributions, but a lot of domestic workers are informal working for households. Um, I should say, point out in this context with private sector partners here, that the growing segment in almost every country is informal employment for formal enterprises. That's the one that we see growing a lot, and that's why the Europeans use this term precarious employment, because they can see more and more of it. And then informal economy is sort of the broadest concept. It refers to all units, activities, enterprises, workers, so defined, and the output from them. And this, too, was endorsed by the International Labor Organization at its annual conference in 2002. So in sum, the informal economy is the diversified set of economic activities, enterprises, workers, that are not regulated by the state and do not have employment-based social protection and the output that they produce. And in India, we heard that they produce 50% or more of GDP. So I, I wanted to go through that definition, uh, although it's there, just so we're, we're very clear. And I will elaborate a little bit on informal employment, because we are talking about the informal workforce. And this is one way to get at who we're talking about which is, and this concept was used by Ivan, status in employment. Labor statisticians categorize workers by status in employment. It's not just formal versus informal. It's actually more um, subcategories. And so the two basic categories are whether you're self-employed and whether you have a wage worker, right? Um, and the self-employed in informal enterprises are part of the informal economy. There are self-employed professionals. I'm sure there's some here in the room. Uh, <laughs> but those don't belong in the informal economy. Um, and the categories of um, the self-employed that are very important to keep in mind, some are employers who hire others. But that group is less than 5% in most countries. 
and it's less than 10% in China. But most places, it's less than 5%, all right? And I say that because when we're thinking of poor and non-poor in the informal economy, we have data from a growing number of countries. The only group that's non-poor in the informal economy are the employers who hire others. All the rest, the poor own account workers. The own account workers are those who operate on their own account, don't hire workers, may have some unpaid contributing family workers. They often, in many countries, <laughs> earn, on average, less than the employees of the informal employers. So they're, they're not doing all that well. Um, and, the, and then, of course, there are the unpaid contributing family workers who are sharing that meager income with the own account person who's head of a family firm. Uh, and then there are some, but we don't capture many of these, informal producer cooperative members. The wage workers in the informal jobs um, are the informal employees of the informal empl enterprises, but they also they're informal employees of formal firms and domestic workers hired by um, individuals, households without employer. But if you notice in this definition, this is still the official definition, there are other categories that aren't in here. Where are the casual day laborers, right? And a big category that we work with are the industrial outworkers. They're not in here. So another frontier in improving data is that we're working with the International Conference of Labor Statisticians to open up and have more categories and unpack employees and what kind of employees. And there's, these are the basic categories, but they don't do the full job. So there's another th frontier in improving the data on these workers. All right, so here's one slide that captures 17 years of work. <laughs> it looks so simple. Here we are, have some averages and ranges for uh, the incidence of uh, informal employment and non-ag employment, um, but it's taken 17 years of work to get this. Um, and the next frontier is to define informality in agriculture, because there isn't a consensus. We have to get the FAO to agree and the ILO, and we don't have it yet. We have a definition, but it's all those, the formal are those who work in plantations or large farm holders. The small holders, the agricultural day laborers, the pastoralists, the fisher folk, the forest gatherers, they're all informal, but we, we can't measure it yet. But if we measured informal employment as a share of total employment, the average in ranges, the, the percentages would be higher. So South Asia um, is the region with the highest incidence, 82%. Um, with a range, and this is non-ag employment. India does capture informality in agri, it does itself. So then we get, if we add agriculture, it goes up to 94%. But in non-ag, it's 84, in only urban in India, it's 80%. So 80% only urban, 84% non-ag, and 94% total employment is informal in modern India. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, we were surprised by the regional estimate, but we know it's lower because in the southern cone, particularly South, South Africa, the incidence is much lower than in other parts. Um, so it's as high as 82% of non-ag employment in Mali. We have a national figure for total employment in Ghana, and it's 90%. Um, so, and uh, East and Southeast Asia, not far behind. Uh, this does not include China. We finally have some data from China, urban China, six cities, and it's about one-third of urban employment in modern China, excluding the migrants. If you include the migrants, then it's, then it's higher. Latin America, just over half, um, but a fair, fairly broad range of countries. And the Middle East and North Africa, it's the lowest uh, incidents in developing regions, but I'm told by uh, Raghi Assad, who does really good work on, on labor force data, that if you excluded the public sector in uh, that region, there's a lot of public sector employment, you'd have figures similar to um, probably South Asia. Um, so those, this is what we've been able to pull together. It's taken a lot of work. Um, and I just I wish I had included two slides that I didn't. One was 
a slide with some pictures. Anyway, I was in a rush, I guess. But um, just to give you a sense, I've given you a sense who they would be in the rural areas. What we know, and we know it quite well for the urban areas, is that um, two big sectors are construction and transport. And then personal services of various kinds, including domestic work quite large. And then the three groups, um, well, the four groups that we're concerned about, domestic workers, home-based workers, street vendors, and waste pickers. And we now have, this is another frontier we crossed, we now have data for 16 cities, um, 10 countries, I think, on the actual percentage of the urban workforce that are these different categories. The four categories we work with, uh, domestic workers, home-based workers, street vendors, waste pickers, in modern urban India represent one-third of the modern labor force. So one in three are in these very low end. Um, you'd think you'd have more high end stuff in urban parts of, in urban areas. So these are significant groups and they, they are on average at very poor levels of earnings from poor households that depend largely on informal employment. We have some breakdown on that score as well. And um, they are at the bottom of the pyramid, but they're economically active and they contribute. And we're delighted that the universal health coverage debate wants to incorporate them. So let's look at what we know from our research um, on the linkages between informal workers, universal health, occupational. And just going to talk about the risks of exposure that they face relative to formal workers, and then the barriers to access. And then I'll look at the three groups. So relative to formal workers, they have greater exposure to health risks, um, especially the occupational health risk. Uh, the kinds of work environments they're in, the kinds of things they do, you know, they're breaking down that ship in Italy, I mean, the shipbreaking industry is one of the very toxic. I mean, the things that they do um, are very harsh. And it's due both to the living environment and the work environment. Both are, are, are really critical. And they have less protection against loss of income. When you are ill or when you're chronically uh, anemic or chronically um, have a chronic illness, um, you just don't earn as much income as you're not as productive as you might have been. And you might even not even be able to work on a given day. And you have no compensation uh, for those kinds of days um, when you can't work or where your productivity declines because of, um, of ill health and that you don't have paid sick leave. Um, so it's a very difficult juggling act. Um, and they have less protection against the costs of health risk due to the lack of employer contributions to health insurance and as yet limited access to universal health coverage. So on both sides, the earlier version of, of employment link, um, they are, um, have much higher risks. Then the barriers of access, um, they have lack access de jure to health insurance and health services. Um, often because the systems and the schemes and are not appropriately designed, and we heard a uh, quite um, telling account of that from Mirai, um, they don't take into this account the specific realities of informal work. The earlier model where it was employment linked um, assumed self-employment was going to go away and you would just have modern wage employment. Most developing countries, that hasn't happened. You have an incidence of self-employment anywhere between a third to a half of the workforce. So they've never had employer contributions, right? And now you have once formal wage workers being hired below certain time levels and also they don't get the protections. Um, and then the risks are very occupation-specific risks that they face. And they have less access de facto to health insurance and health services even to those which they are entitled. One is due to lack of knowledge of their entitlements, and Mirai had a very practical um, suggestion, just paint what this clinic offers to you free so you know what you're entitled to. Um, they have less ability to negotiate the bureaucracy, and I liked your 
bullet about the formal uh, workers are more organized, have more ability to negotiate, and the informal workers tend to be less well organized, although they are organizing, um, but certainly less ability to negotiate the, the bureaucracy. And then, of course, there are the standard leakages and blockages in the health system that we know about. And my colleague from South Africa, Francie Lund, will always remind me that it's not just leakages and blockages, but it's lack of coordination because where you need to go, and I think we'll hear this from Laura's presentation for, for different things, uh, makes it that you have to negotiate a fairly um, wide number of parts of the city or parts of the health system to get um, because of the lack of coordination. So what we've learned about the three specific groups, some of these are, are common to all three, but some are particular to the, uh, to the kind of work they do. The home-based workers, you saw in the picture the woman who made a thousand kites, where is she sitting? She's sitting on the floor, okay? So a lot of musculoskeletal stress. Um, there's a lot of exposure to toxic substances. Who knows what kind of glue she was using? The women who make incense sticks are inhaling, um, it's called perfume, but it's hardly a perfume um, at, all, at all times. And there's um, psychological stress. Um, it's a very key factor. You keep hearing people uh, talk about the psychological stress of having to fill a work order, not getting a work order, uh, irregular earnings. And what we also know from this recent study is that after the global financial crisis, which didn't wear off its effects on these workers, demand is still low, inflation has just taken off. And so the new financial crisis for them is the cost of fuel, the cost of food, the cost of education, health. Um, for the home-based workers, their home is their workplace. And most of them are working in, at best, a one-bedroom little place, sometimes just a single room with a front veranda and maybe a side kitchen. Um, and so this small cramped space doubles as work and living space and often has very poor ventilation. Um, if you're home-based, you're often very isolated unless you have a remarkable organization like um, SEWA, which we've heard about, or HomeNet Thailand, which we will hear about. And so you, you're isolated. You don't know that you're, you have sisters who are facing the same problems. You're not necessarily organized. And so you don't really know even what would be preventive health measures, some very simple preventive health measurements, measures much less what you're entitled to in terms of health services. And you lack bargaining power. Um, it isn't just a technological fix, guys. This is an institutional fix. And power and organization and being able to negotiate the bureaucracy are huge in this environment. Um, and they have limited time and mobility. Um, why are 30% of women working from their homes in, in South Asia is partly due to gender norms that don't encourage women to deal with strangers, to move outside the home. So they, um, and they're therefore even more handicapped in negotiating the bureaucracy. Um, and then there's lack of rec recognition. How many of us knew that 30% of the workforce in India, how many of us know that 80% of manufacturing units in modern India are, are informal, right? Are, and of those, of those 75, 75% are home-based across industries, automobile. Uh, we just don't know this. We don't know how much pro production is taking place in the homes. And so they're not really visible to the system and therefore not targeted or, um, or in integrated. Um, the street vendors, um, their work involves a lot of hauling, transporting, um, settling goods, taking it back for storage at the end of the day. I spent two days and two nights with a street vendor in Ahmedabad, India, thanks to Sewa, uh, a year and a half ago. And we, we, we began the day by going to this little place where she stored her goods. It was just on a street corner with a tarp and a little log over it, and the storekeeper down the way said he would keep an eye on it. Um, but she had to go every day to that storage place, and bring it, unpack it, settle her little display on the ground, and then at the end of the day, take back. Um, and then she has to go to the wholesale market, which we also went to. Um, 
and, um, and transport goods from there. And then you're sitting, standing, moving about. Um, physical abuse, one source of injury is physical abuse by the police if you're street vendors. And then the, again, the psychological stress. And for the street vendors, there's a constant fear of evictions and confisc confiscation of your goods. Um, and they just always have a watchful eye out for the police. Um, and then they too often lack organization, although of all the groups, the ones that are most likely to have a local organization because they need it to deal with the public authorities um, are the street vendors. And finally, the waste pickers. Um, my goodness, they're, they're sorting and they're transporting goods. Uh, and they're reclaiming recyclable waste from, from whatever the dump or where they've sorted goods. And they're often exposed to hazardous waste materials. And they also um, have psychological stress due to harassment. The public doesn't like them. The police don't like them. The dogs don't like them. You know, they, they're, they're hounded in, in doing this work. Um, and of course, they're exposed to the elements and pollution. Um, and at the dump sites, um, there's a real risk of accidents because they're clamoring up these heaps and these, they, they collapse or the trucks come in with the waste. So there's, um, it's, it's quite hazardous. Um, and again, lack of organization. But one victory, there is organization in Brazil. And the Brazilian National Association of Waste Pickers won the contract to clean the stadium during the World Cup. This was huge. It would not happen without organization, right? And it also it helped that Lula used to spend every Christmas Eve with the waste pickers in, uh, in his country. He, he was uh, very supportive of their cause. But it takes organization to get that kind of breakthrough. So the way forward, I mean, these are issues that have already been spelled out, but we really do need to think what, you know, what mix of services and benefits? What about promotive and preventive health? Um, is it only private insurance for hospitalization like we're seeing happening in India so much? Um, how is it finances? Is it taxes and or contributions, premiums? Who provides the insurance? Um, is it government? Is it private for-profit, private not-for-profit? Is it, are those providers of insurance regulated? Is it only for tertiary care? Um, who provides the services? Are those regulated? Any caps on expenditures? This is also um, India. I grew up in India, so I, I follow the story in India very closely, and it, it really hurts me that there is private insurance and private provision without any regulation and any caps on expenditures. It needs to change. And what ha we had in Japan was an example of a model in the 30s that started with regulation and caps. It was there from the beginning. I don't know why we failed so miserably in India. Um, and then, of course, we need uh, to reform the occupational health system to take into account the fact that people aren't working in a shop floor or an office. They're working on the streets. They're working in homes. They're, uh, working at construction sites, and we need to change those systems. So finally, um, this is a dense slide, um, and I've tried to capture, and my colleagues may um, say I haven't quite, but the, the bullets in bold are what I think the WeGo Network and our allies see as essential. Um, the ones that are in italics um, are acceptable. And the ones that are in plain text are not acceptable. Um, for instance, regressive taxes. <laughs> um, so in terms of services, we need the whole range. Um, in terms of pro promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, we need the primary, secondary, tertiary. We need the occupational health and safety appropriate to the work of these workers. And we need free, essential medicines. Um, or subsidized. Um, in terms of financing, we really believe it should be tax-based and progressive tax taxation. Um, for insurance, um, 
Government run would be ideal, but private for profit, private nonprofit are acceptable so long as they are regulated. And we do also um, like and welcome cooperatives that are owned, insurance cooperatives owned by workers with the SEWA again as sort of the, the leading star primary example. In terms of provision, we've got to have primary health care centers still in, in developing countries. And we need government hospitals and doctors. Um, but we can have private providers uh, so long as they're sort of contracted in, sort of in, in a system that has some regulation. And finally, I just wanted to say we do want public-private partnerships, but we want these to include the organizations of informal workers. And we have a database on organizations of informal workers from around the world. It's growing. There's 600 or so that we actually know, have data on. And community health workers um, would be ideal. And I just wanted to end on a personal note. Um, I have had the deep privilege of working with two remarkable organizations in South Asia. I worked for many years with BRAC, uh, the world's largest NGO. And I've worked for even longer with SEWA, the world's largest union of informal workers. In all of that work, the partnership was between the, either the NGO and government or the union and government. And the private sector was hardly there. I know that there was one public-private partnership with SEWA where it was with the private sector, and it was for slum upgrading, and it was very successful. So I have two things to say to the Forum on Public-Private Partnerships. One is I'm hugely honored and delighted to be at a discussion where the private is the private sector, because I just don't go to that very often. To us, the private is civil society and, you know, uh, or the organizations of workers. The other is, and I'll end with the slogan of StreetNet International, which is the international network of street vendors that um, WeGo and SEWA helped found. And their slogan is, nothing for us without us. And so I would really challenge, if you're working on health for informal workers, that you must indeed have to, if we're going to do this right, involve the organizations of those workers. Thank you.